Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Karen Rath, and I'm welcoming you today to the Kaleido LA Artist Speaker Series. I'm currently on the campus of Loyola Marymount University in the Westchester neighborhood of Los Angeles. I am noting my location in order to respectfully acknowledge LMU's presence on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. Kaleido LA is the annual artist speaker series of the Department of Art and Art History. The series has been a vital program within the College of Communication and Fine Arts for seven years. In preparing for this fall schedule, I, as director of the LaBand Art Gallery, have been collaborating with the chairs of Art and Art History to bring this series to you virtually. Since this is our first time together, I'd like to offer a bit of background about my approach to serving as guest curator. The Kaleido LA series has long promoted the idea that the arts play a critical role in the education and formation of our students. Today, however, is an unprecedented and transformative time. And it is our own students whose voices are calling loudest for societal and academic change. Indeed, LMU students are making efforts to proactively shape their own pedagogy to co-inform their education and formation. This fall, Kaleido LA is seeking to meet the moment. In building this program, my collaborators and I are curatorially centering artists who identify as BIPOC, an acronym that stands for Black, Indigenous, and People of Color. We are also including members of LGBTQ communities whose artwork and lived experiences foreground issues of social and economic racial justice. It has been my great privilege to invite these eight artists to share their work with us over the course of the coming semester. I welcome you all to our series and in doing so thank the multiple individuals who have contributed their time and labor to produce all the elements of this program behind the scenes on social media, on our website, on camera, and in the Dean's office. And I welcome you, our guests today, for building a community with us. A note about housekeeping and structure. We have enabled the Q&A feature for you to use. June Edmonds has organized her talk in multiple sections, and you are welcome to ask your question during her talk as she transitions from one section to the next. Our webinar team will acknowledge your question and it will be read aloud by Molly Corey, the LeBans Gallery Manager. There will also be a Q&A at the end of June's presentation. The webinar today is being recorded and it will be archived on the YouTube, YouTube channel for LMU CFA and there will be a link on our website. Now I have the pleasure of introducing June Edmonds. June was born and raised in Los Angeles. In discussing her upbringing on a recent podcast, she talks about the formative experience of visiting our own LACMA, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, in her childhood and being influenced by both individual artworks and exhibitions that she encountered there. She completed her BA in art at San Diego State University, and she holds an MFA in painting 
from the Tyler School of Art in Philadelphia. She attended the prestigious Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. And she also completed the certificate program in social emotional arts at UCLA. She is the recipient of grants from the California Arts Council and awards from the City of LA's 2018 COLA Award given to visual artists. Her work has been featured in group shows that touch on themes of race, feminism, community, and abstraction, to name a few. She has a very robust website that I highly recommend you visit and she is represented by the gallery, Luis de Jesus, Los Angeles. Her recent work, the conceptually potent and visually stunning flag series has been written about in Art Forum, the Los Angeles Times, and has resulted in June winning the inaugural AWARE Prize awarded by the Archives of Women Artists Research and Exhibitions at the Armory Show in New York, New York. This prize was awarded in 2020. It was awarded just a few days before our entire country went into lockdown due to COVID-19. June was supposed to come to campus in April and her talk was postponed to today. We are tremendously fortunate to have June join us to be a part of this intimate experience that Zooming is affording us. I welcome everyone to Kaleido and I welcome you, June, to LMU. June, I invite you to turn your video camera and sound on as now I turn off mine. Okay. Thank you so much, Karen. That was an amazing introduction. Thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here. And I want to thank the team. I want to thank Jane uh, Bruckner for the initial suggestion and for Nicole Murph for the initial work that she had done. And also the team today, Molly, Emma, and Arturo. I think I'll share my screen. Uh, to get started. Thank you everybody for coming today. It's such an honor to have you here. All right, so to begin, um, I wanted to acknowledge just my upbringing and my mother who is sitting with her three children, my brother, my sister, who um, would have been an artist, I believe, in another life. She drew all the time and, and she took us to museums and to art classes. And uh, I mentioned before, and Karen referred to my mother taking me, it was a very special trip to uh, LA County Museum to see the two centuries of Black American art show, which was uh, an amazing experience to see uh, Black art and see images of people that look like myself and look like family members and open the door to the idea that uh, Black people can be artists as well. Um, I took art in high school and loved it then. You know, I had an art teacher that, that took us on field trips and, and one field trip was to go see a French film uh, called Beauty and the Beast. So it was the original Beauty and the Beast. 
And I just remember being so fascinated and loving that movie so much that I kind of had a clue at that time that I was an artist. I went to San Diego State. You know, my dad always uh, let us know that, that we were going to college. So I was very fortunate in that way to have uh, parents that geared us in that direction. And um, it was a it was a struggle at first. You know, I had lost my mom at the age of, of 17. So I was reeling from that. But in a, a few years in, I did take an art class and uh, met the greatest influence in my art life, my teacher by the name of Joy Shipman, who uh, guided me uh, throughout my whole time at uh, San Diego State. We, when I met her, I had just come back from a trip. Well, actually I met her in my first drawing class. And I took this drawing class when I was really young. Uh, in school, I'd started college when I was 17. So I took this drawing class and I didn't take art seriously. And uh, I just had another idea about what this art class should be. And so uh, Joy Shipman was very kind in giving me an incomplete in this class uh, as opposed to what I really deserve. But then I went to, a few years later, I went to um, Washington, D.C. And all the museums are free in Washington, D.C. And I saw a post-impressionist uh, show and I, I uh, went to the African galleries and I just fell uh, really head over heels with the idea of being an art maker. And I came back and, and I took some more art classes and I took a painting class. And, um, and that's when I met Joy again and I was hoping she didn't remember me from the drawing class. But we, we were really speaking the same language. She was speaking a language that I just understood from the beginning. So, so it was, it was uh, very uh, amazing in that way where I just learned so much and, and gleaned as much as I could, you know, from her and, and that support. So this is a, my first painting, you know, like uh, we did a lot of uh, paintings with different kinds of colors. So this is my first uh, full color still life that I did in my first painting class. Um, this is at San Diego State as well. And uh, this is a self-portrait there. And this is the studio there at San Diego State. And the studio really looked just like that. That's my backpack <laughs> there. And um, a painting that I remember painting at the time. So uh, this is uh, in that class. And um, another thing, you know, after I started painting, I really enjoyed painting uh, interiors, figures and interiors. And I was looking at a lot of the artists, like I said, that were in that uh, 200 or two centuries of African-American art, Black art. I was also looking at the post-impressionists. I was looking at Barnett Honeywood um, and uh, Matisse as well. And if you look on the wall, you'll see like on the wall of this artwork right here on the right, you'll see a drawing of a Matisse. And, and the painting right over the figure on the right's head is a reproduction of one of the paintings I saw at the two centuries of Black art. And that was um, that was an artist by the name of uh, Elzir Quarter, and he is uh, from Chicago, and I I really loved his work. Uh, I my friends would used to tease me back in those days, is that if they were sitting in a room for more than two minutes, I would get my sketchbook and draw them, and that is exactly what I did. So. Uh, the figure on the right is sort of a self-portrait and I'm probably looking at my friend trying to figure out if she's getting ready to get up and should I go get my sketchbook. 
this is another one, two friends, be friends from high school really, who are still my friends to this day. And um, this is a scene from home. And uh, there you know, are African fabrics here. And so this is around my third, fourth year of, of school, you know, um, and I was looking at different African fabrics that I wanted to incorporate into my works of art. So, you know, I, I was into the interiors. I, I feel that this piece is very dated, you know, because you see the backgammon board and, uh, and, and things like that in this work of art. So my friend on the left, Lynn Harper, she owns this piece. You know, uh, she bought this piece when we were in our 20s. And that, that's very special to me. Michelle Guerin, who is on the right, you know, I did another version of this painting and she has this, that work as well. At least she did have that work. Uh, this is a painting that I did at that time as well in San Diego. This is my brother uh, who went to UCSD. And so this is in La Jolla. It's like right down the hill from the museum there. And I used to love going to that beach and I loved hanging out with him when I could. And uh, this is a, a product of that. Another one in that series. Uh, this is in an apartment that the sort of the last apartment that me and my roommate Sheila, who was in on the left there, who is still a good friend to this day, we had this apartment and, and we just love this apartment. So I painted it, you know, from the back and from the side. And um, you know, there was things that I was just doing for the first time in this painting, like it was just so much fun to me to to do this interior and to get some landscape into it and and sort of get these colors of San Diego landscape. So all of that, all of that was really a lot of fun. So uh, friends from school. All right, and after San Diego State, you know, I got a scholarship. Uh, to uh, Skowhegan and you know I have a lot of uh, a few paintings from Skowhegan I, I don't have those in slide form I don't have many slides from graduate school either so um, these were just two landscapes that I did these landscapes were right outside the door at San at uh, Skowhegan and um, we the the studio that we were in it was up a hill it was it was uh, a great studio kind of isolated and away from everything so so those of us that were in that studio felt that that we had a really special place. Skowhegan was a very special uh, experience there. Um, just meeting the artists. Uh, 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 David Hockney was there, uh, and um, and some more amazing artists were there. Uh, Jake Pertol, he was like a resident artist, and and he was just a great guy, and uh, just somebody wonderful to talk to, you know, about art. So after graduate school, you know, I came home, and you know, did a few more of these interiors. This one uh, was of a friend of mine, uh, Judge Patty Titus and her sister, uh, Daphne. And unfortunately, they don't have this painting anymore either, but this is another uh, interior, probably uh, one of the last of, this, of the series of interiors. They're watching, if, if you can see the television on the right side, they're watching Ben-Hur. So that's one of my favorite scenes of Ben-Hur. <laughs> right. And uh, I was painting, uh, I was living at home at the time. I was 
uh, painting a self-portrait. That's that on the left side. On the right side, I did a program with self-help graphics, which was really, really wonderful. I worked with a, a, a printmaker, a master printmaker by the name of Jose Apulche. And these, this was a series of uh, silkscreen mono prints that we did. So I was working at Watts Towers at the time. I worked at LA Times for about seven years and then started making a transition into teaching art. And so my first job was at Watts Towers and Mark Greenfield was the director at the time. So Mark um, uh, nominated me to be in this program uh, with uh, uh, this master artist at Self Hope Graph Graphics and and I produced about 10, maybe 20 of these things. And, and this is one of them. And uh, Self-Help Graphics has one or two. And, and I don't remember where the rest are, but it was, it was really great to do this program. So um, if there are any questions, you know, I could take them now. This is a good time to break. Yeah, I have um, uh, one question just came in. Um, do the people who once owned your paintings give them back to you or end up selling them? Um, these early paintings, the, the people that own them are friends. And so the only reason why uh, two of those friends don't have those paintings is for unfortunate reasons, you know, like uh they were uh stolen from them so so yes they they keep them you know uh people will resell artwork but but they they have not resold the artworks and i also had the question of the scale of these what are the general dimensions of these paintings okay a uh, good question uh, the very first ones from school average about uh, four feet tall by six feet wide. Uh, the one of Patty, this one right here, this one's a small painting. So um, this might be only about a foot and a half tall and maybe, you know, 30, 24 inches wide. Uh, these right here, maybe uh, 24 by 30 about that. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that I think might be um, best towards the end because they're definitely will get answered during the course of the next uh, few minutes. So I'm going to just let you go ahead and move on. Okay, sounds great. Okay. So um, in 95, I uh, installed this, this public artwork this was with MTA. So in 1990, I was living in Long Beach and I was getting this magazine called Art Week. Some of you guys might be remember that. That was from way back. And so at the end of Art Week, you know, they had all the ads and there was an ad for artists uh, if they were interested in doing public art. And so one of the stations that they were advertising for was a block and a half away from where I lived. So I pretty much thought that station should be mine, not really thinking about how hard it would be to sort of get this thing. So I, I did a whole lot of homework about how to get a grant. And one suggestion was to, you know, if nobody really knows you, surround yourself with people that really know what they're doing. So that's what I did. I, I found a mosaicist a master mosaicist by the name of Monica Sharp and uh, worked with her. I worked with Peter Carlson for the installation and um, and we came up with these. So, so what I did is, is uh, made a series of paintings. So 12 paintings there, there are 12 panels all together. And uh, there's six pylons, so six of the panels are facing south and six of the panels are facing north. 
And so the, so, the southern uh, facing panels are sort of these, most of them are these ancient colossal heads that represent the uh, cultures and nationalities that, that are in Long Beach, especially were in Long Beach at the time. And the ones that are facing north are scenes of Long Beach, you know. So um, Monica, she uh, fabricated all these in a year and all 11 panels, but I wanted her to teach me how to do mosaic as well. So I fabricated a panel. Uh, it took me the entire year to do that one panel. So it's super, super labor intensive. So I just have uh, so much respect for uh, this, this work, but they started off as paintings. And what Monica wanted to do and what she set out to do was to sort of imitate my style of painting with mosaic. So especially like in some of the black areas, uh, they mimic sort of the brush strokes that, that I was using. So uh, this uh, panel right here is, you know, an homage to Mexico. So you see the Olmec head there, but you also see this figure uh, that I sort of took directly from a mural uh, that I saw in Mexico. In fact, my trip to Mexico is that I took with my friend Salentia, you know, maybe just a year before, uh, really uh, inspired this whole piece. Uh, this piece right here, uh, it's called uh, Return, I think, uh, of uh, Quetzalcoatl. And the red figure in the front is evidently sort of leading the way. And I just love this mural. It's made out of Venetian glass mosaic. And when I saw this, I thought I would love to do this when I get back to LA. So this uh, MTA was my opportunity to, to do that. And, and so that's why I, I wanted to acknowledge, you know, uh, these wonderful works of, of art that I saw when I was in Mexico, and namely at the University of Mexico. So uh, the name of this artist, uh, his, his name is Jose Chavez uh, Mur Murado. Uh, also in Long Beach, there's a large uh, Cambodian community. And so in fact, it's the largest, at the time, it was the largest outside of Cambodia. Uh, we had the largest population of Cambodians outside of Cambodia. Now we're number, uh, Long Beach is number two to Paris. But I have uh, the woman in a traditional sort of uh, silk lace blouse uh, that was, that was popular. And the, the colossal head is from a religious temple in Cambodia called the, the Bayon. This is the mosaic that I did, you know? So uh, as I said, uh, it took Monica a year to do 11 panels. It took me a year to do this, this one panel. So I'm really proud of it, but it literally took me all year to do. But I learned a lot and it was, uh, fantastic to do. Okay, uh, I have a couple scenes of Long Beach here. So I have a father and son here. The father uh, reading together with his son. Uh, this was done in 1995. The size is 42 inches in diameter. Um, you'll notice he has on a, a cross colors t-shirt, which is uh, very much of that time. Uh, the little boy uh, is reading a book, Stolen Legacy. So you might, if you've seen that book, uh, you'll recognize uh, the picture of the Egyptian pharaoh that is on this book. So the father is teaching uh, his son his history. This is a donut shop. This is a woman that will go to a donut shop that was uh, right down the street from me that came all the time. And I loved her hair and I wanted to paint her and I did. 
the background is of a mosaic from Tunisia. Tunisia is known for their very, very beautiful mosaics. That is a floor mosaic right there that is in Tunisia. Okay, so um, that was uh, installed in 95 and 97. Uh, I did a couple artist residencies. So one was at Dorlin Mountain Community uh, that's in Temecula, California. Uh, and the other one was at Helene Wurlitzer Foundation, uh, which is in New Mexico. So it was the first time I've done one since uh, uh, Skowhegan. It was amazing to do. You know, I was working maybe seven jobs, <laughs> you know, at the time. So to take the time off was, um, was pretty awesome to do. And uh, I, I just wanted to uh, like not worry about uh, models. I, I wanted to uh, remove everything, you know, uh, that was representative of anything from, from my artwork. So that was color and figures. And I just wanted to uh, be, have and do a more sort of intimate work of art, you know, that, that was more inspired uh, by, you know, intuition, if you will. So, so this series, uh, this piece is probably about uh, 20 inches by 26 inches. It's all charcoal, different kinds of charcoals, uh, layer upon layer. Uh, I did this one at Dorlin as well. So they, they do start taking on sort of uh, the personality of landscape. You know, that wasn't the intention, but it just sort of went there, uh, goes there naturally. So um, also at Dorlin, you know, it's a wonderful place. Unfortunately, about 15 years ago, there was a fire. Speaking of, of fires, you know, and the devastating effects of fires. We're going through that now. Um, so Skowhegan burnt down completely to the ground. And a few years later, they did decide to rebuild. So there, it was a small residency to begin with. There might have been only eight houses, you know, for artists. You know, now there might be about six. They did start rebuilding. Um, I went to um, Helene Wurlitzer after that in New Mexico, uh, it was really the month later and it was three months there. So, uh, it was, it was an, another fantastic time. I was, uh, had sort of this habit of working in the daytime, you know, when it was daylight and, uh, just sort of reading wonderful literature at night. So it was really a great time. So I ended up naming these after uh, literature. The one on the left is named Heart and Bones, which is a poem from uh, one of my favorite poets, uh, Lucille Clifton. And the one on the right is Beloved. And uh, this one actually named after a movie when I got to New Mexico in April of 1997, there was a Black Film Festival going on, which was amazing. And there was a movie uh, about uh, a, a kid in Mozin, from Mozambique that was born during a, an eclipse. So, um, so this one is, is uh, inspired by that movie. So uh, I did a few more public art um, commissions after that. This is the Algin Sutton Rec Center. I fabricated this one on my own and and again this is very labor intensive. I really started appreciating uh, Monica after this. Uh, again, uh, uh, it, it just is it very, very time consuming. So this is a detail of um, maybe the, the second panel. I also wanted to uh, hone my drawing. I wanted to teach drawing uh, in the class, 
uh, in college. So I did did these about this time. I'm gonna go a little bit faster. I'm looking at the time. Uh, this uh, mosaic right here is the LA Child Guidance Center. And I worked with some of my students. I was doing a dual enrollment class at uh, Jefferson uh, High School. And some of the students helped me out with this. Uh, we did a mosaic project there. Um, I started adding color back into my palette. And, um, and I first started doing sort of this energy burst series uh, when uh, uh, maybe in early 1990s as well. No, early 2000s. And I started off with circles, just only circles. And uh, then I just started adding more circles. These are two different paintings here. Um, I was uh, playing around with uh, monochromatic painting and, and uh, in some instances and uh, I was being inspired. The one on the left here is called G's Jungle. So being directly inspired by uh, G's Ben Quilt, you know, one in particular. The piece on the right is called Patrick Spills. And I had a student, a fourth grade student by the name of Patrick, and he was having a bad day. And, and it just seemed like he just spilled all of his emotions on his artwork. And it, it was just the most beautiful artwork I've ever seen in my life and and uh, he used a lot of the colors that are in that piece on the right side there. This one is called Wait for Diva and uh, I, I am saying for the first time this one a lot of times these are uh, uh, portraits in a way and this one actually is uh, dedicated to Whitney Houston and it's called Wait for Diva because I felt when she died, it was just such a disappointment because we were all kind of waiting for her to get better. I think we believed that she would finally come back to herself. So uh, that is what that is named after. Uh, in 2016, I wanted to do a series of sort of continuous paintings. So it was like a series of eight paintings that I ended up showing at the uh, uh, Manhattan Beach Art Center uh, show curated by uh, Esther Delgado is a uh, uh, also uh, awesome uh, work, uh, awesome show that I enjoyed. Uh, Pam Smith Hudson was in that, and Nicolette Camimos. So um, uh, I painted this one later. Uh, this one in 2017 at a residency uh, in Paducah, Kentucky. And the title of this one is uh, Story of the Ohio. And so this one is kind of a portrait as well, uh, honoring uh, Margaret Garner, who is uh, an enslaved woman who uh, uh, proved by killing one of her children that she would rather have uh, death and then freedom, you know, for for her children. Uh, the book Beloved is is inspired by her story. Uh, these next works are works that I did um, after I got the cola in 2017. It was such an honor to get that, you know. I really. Uh, one, I got a studio because of that, you know, the studio at Angel's Gate now. I was able to have space for the first time. Uh, I got a taste of it when I was uh, at uh, the uh, Artisan Residence in Paducah, uh, which is, um, uh, anyway, so I did these paintings here. This is the detail. Uh, the name of this painting here is Ufufuo which is rebirth or resurrection. Here are some details of, of that painting. It's a huge painting. It's about eight feet tall and maybe 12 feet wide. Uh, this was in that exhibition as well. This one's called Nina, which means mother. And uh, so you've got this uh, old, uh, old uh, uh, bova right here, but um, a, a very glorious, uh, Volva, 
uh, of color, if you will. And so I'm speaking about the beginning of life here. Uh, I did the first flag series, you know, the first of the flag series there as well. Um, I did a few more. And um, the color palette that I'm using at this point, for the most part, are primary colors, if you will. And uh, I'm taking those primary colors to skin tones, you know, uh, and neutral. And so that's what you see in these pieces. These pieces, the past five, uh, were in a show at Launch LA with Anne Marie Rousseau. And so um, these. Uh, last ones were at the show at Luis de Jesus Los Angeles uh, in the flag series. So uh, again, I'm, I'm using uh, skin tones uh, that are derived from primary colors. So instead of red, white, and blue, I'm, I'm using red, white, and and yellow. And uh, and so. I am basically uh, reclaiming the flag for uh, what it is really uh, intended to stand for. So uh, this piece on the right, it's uh, the League of Six Nations flag and uh, dedicated to sort of the, the fathers of democracy that are in America, which are the Iroquois Indians. And uh, these are installation shots uh, from that exhibition. Uh, this is uh, installation, a memorial installation for uh, uh, Car William Carney, who was in the Civil War uh, uh, in a very important battle at uh, Fort uh, Sumter. And a uh, story has it where uh, the flag bearer uh, was shot and uh, Carney picked up the flag and held it up and made sure it didn't uh, touch the ground until he was uh, be able to come back to uh, friendly lines. And so what these represent to me, and this, this, uh, these are how I first envisioned the flags. The flags were all black, they were draped, and they uh, sort of represent uh, promises that have yet to be um, fulfilled. Uh, they represent a struggle, but they represent a hope, faith, and belief, you know, uh, above understanding, you know, uh, to me as well. So that's the first sort of iteration of that installation. Uh, these two works were in the New York show at the Armory. And uh, this uh, is the, the installation that was at Jill Moniz's space uh, downtown. And this is, is her installation, uh, which is a, a very beautiful iteration. Uh, this to me sort of represents triumph. And so, so that's it as far as the slideshow goes. And I can take any questions. Thank you so much, June. Um, we have an amazing array of questions. We may not be able to get to all of them, but at this point, I'm gonna just interject a few that are very related to um, uh, what you were just speaking uh, to. Um, our first is saying, I love the textiles and fabric patterns in your early work. It seems very much connected to your later flag works and materials choices. Pattern and textiles seem to be a through line in your practice. Is this intentional? Uh, uh, yes, but I, I think it's, it's subconscious as well, you know? So, so yes, uh, you know, like I said, even with that, the one, uh, energy energy burst one called G's jungle is specifically uh, inspired by uh, the the uh, quilts of G's Ben. Um, 
Um, my next question I have, um, what do you believe your purpose as an artist is? And also, how would you say being a Black artist in America shaped your pathway to where you are now? Would you change any of your experiences or would you keep them? Um, that's a lot of uh, very heavy questions, <laughs> but great questions. So, um, you know, Black art shaped me from the beginning. It just shaped me from the beginning. Uh, art shaped me from the beginning. Uh, because of my mother and her exposing us to art. But even back when I was growing up, we had uh, Charles White prints in my house. And so I would try to copy those and they were just so beautiful. And I remember looking at those pieces and seeing family members. And, and, and so doing something other than that has just never been a consideration. You know, so, um, uh, so for me, black art is art. It's, it's just no other way. You know, it, as far as a purpose goes, I think that, that as long as you are painting, you know, uh, authentically, you know, something that, excites you, is interesting to you, is uh, on your heart. As long as you're doing that, you're, you're within your purpose, you know. Thank you. Um, the next question we have is, what has been your experience with being a woman in the art world? Do you find it harder to gain respect than it would be for a male artist? Um, you know, I mean that that goes without that goes without saying. You know, I mean I've been in this this game for you know I've been painting for forty years now, so I've I've seen a lot, experienced a lot. You know, um, but my first teacher was a woman, and and that's really all I needed. My first teachers were women you know, my mom, you know, so, so as a black woman, you, you really understand, you know, what your strength is, it's sort of like, despite all of this craziness, you know, look at, look at these women whose shoulders I stand on, you know, like, look at these women, who, uh, like Edmonia Lewis, or, 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 uh, you know, of course, Alma Thomas, you know, who worked her whole life full time as a teacher, you know, because, you know, foundations weren't coming after her, you know, uh, in other reasons, but uh, created, you know, uh, some of the, the greatest art on the planet. So, so yes, there's absolutely been challenges. Uh, but, you know, I'm so inspired, like even the flags, they're inspired. There are these people that believed in our democracy, believed in this country while they were slaves. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so, uh, so the chat, whatever challenges, that we have, there they can be heartbreaking. They can be debilitating. You know, I've been depressed. You know, um, but nothing in comparison to the people whose shoulders I stand on. Yes, thank you. Um, we have a question here that says, your palette is so vibrant and the gesture is so lively. Can you speak to that? And does that relate to the emotion you stated about the people, I believe the person is speaking about the early works, the people and the locations. So in that early college work. Um, you know, the, the art that, you know, I just, I really loved the most were, these uh, paintings with these 
these palettes, you know? So uh, in graduate school, I was told, stop using so much color, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I just have always loved it. I appreciate your comment about how you're relating it to the subject matter. You know, I was just used to painting people I just really, really loved. You know, they weren't models, they were my friends, they were my family. So, um, so I do believe that that all works together. Um, the next question is, uh, first says, June, thank you for sharing about your art journey. Can you speak to your visual art practice and teaching practice, both in terms of philosophy and pedagogy? My practice um, has evolved over the years. Um, my my teaching is just understanding that that everybody has something to share and everything has everybody has something important to express and and i i sincerely appreciate all of it you know and most of us are teachers like that like you could scribble on a piece of paper and show it to me and I'm going to have a visceral, uh, excited reaction to it and, and try to ex explain, you know, why, you know, so, so, um, as it, as a instructor, you are always just trying to, uh, widen, widen your vocabulary. So, so the students really sort of understand uh, you and understand what, what they already are bringing to the table. Um, and I, I learn a lot from, from students, you know, students have helped me in my projects, you know, uh, and sometimes I'll teach something in class and, and I work it out in the studio myself, you know, so uh, now my studio practice is, is uh, and it has been, you know, very regimented, you know, I, I work certain hours and I'm in the studio uh, certain hours. These are my studio hours and these are, these are my teaching hours. So, so I just feel like uh, all I have to think about uh, is showing up at the studio, just showing up and then everything else sort of works itself out. There's quite a few questions about the flag metaphor in your paintings. Um, maybe you could, um, let's see, I love the connection and natural transition from mosaic to pattern brushwork in meditation circles and flags. Did you have a conscious awareness of that or was it intuitive? And then there's numerous other questions just about the flag metaphor. So um, the circle uh, paintings really came out of uh, my uh, meditation practice or my meditation practice at, at the time. So, um, and my attraction to mosaic, you know, like my, my first attraction to mosaic was in uh, Mexico. You know, when I saw those wonderful mosaics at the University of, of Mexico, so um, I, I didn't really see the mosaic as, as brush strokes, but I know I connected to them and, and, I, and people always point out to me that, that, um, that there's such similarity between a mosaic and in the way I uh, use paint. And, uh, as, as far as the flags go, you know, the, the story that I tell is, is really what they were inspired by. They were inspired by a dream. And in that dream, the flags look like this. And, you know, when I asked myself, well, why am I dreaming? 
you know, of these flags and how do I even know that they're flags? You know, this was in 2017. It was uh, the year that I did go uh, uh, to the Alonzo Davis owned uh, residency in Paducah, Kentucky. Like that was 2017 and, and the world changed, you know, and we got a new president. And the idea of going to Paducah, Kentucky meant one thing when I applied in 2015 and another thing when I went in 2017. So um, I would drive around, you know, in small roads in Kentucky, uh, one instance in particular where there's like a Confederate flag, Confederate flags in front of a house that's as, as big as is the wall of my living room. And, and uh, feeling that this road I'm on, I better not get a flat tire. And the mind tricks that we know damn well that that um, flag is, is supposed to do. So, so I felt that, that the flag dream was a reaction to interacting with those flags in that way. You know, when I went to Paducah, Kentucky, it was the first time I've ever been in the South. It, you know, so uh, I believe that it, it's a reaction. It was a reaction at that moment in 2017 when um, the country, you know, uh, took, you know, the racism was always there. So when it took sort of that blatant uh, racist twist in 2017. Um, I have a, another sort of follow-up question. Um, I would, this person said, I was floored by your flag series as it visually, uh, visually loaded and reinterpreting, reinterpreting histories. If you could curate these ser this series anywhere in the world or universe at any time, past, present, future, or dream space, where would you display it? Uh, you know, they're, they're American. So they're American flags. So I want them here in America, you know, to, to be honest with you. So, um, so anywhere, you know, when I, when I think of the uh, Carney Memorial, those, those draped flags, you know, um, I would love them to be in the land somewhere, you know, the, a nice long row, uh, a series of them, you know, maybe as many states as we have. <laughs> yeah, I would agree with that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I have one question, um, which is perfect because it was uh, asked by a professor, um, very logistical, right? Um, really wanted to know about art making costs. How did you find the resources to support art supplies at the beginning of your career? I've just always had a job. You know, so I've always had a job. I've always worked full time. You know, my close friends tease me about how many jobs I have or at one period of time, but, but I've always supported myself. I've always supported myself. So, so when I got that grant, you know, I've always, and with that said, you know, my studio was my bedroom. My studio was my kitchen. I know, you know, many of you guys identify with this. So in 2017, you know, uh, I got $10,000. I was able to get a studio, you know, a studio. I was able to get paint, you know, like my whole life, you know, when I get to the end of a tube of paint, cadmium red or something like that, I start getting nervous, you know, because that means I got to find $20 somewhere, you know, and so when I got that grant, you know, that, that stress uh, was gone at that time, so, so that was beautiful. I have one um, last question. I know that we're not going to be able to get to all questions, but I think this is a kind of good ending question. And then I'm sure Karen will probably want to pop in again. 
Um, what are you working on now and where are you finding inspiration during the pandemic? Um, I'm, I'm working on a number of things. I'm working on uh, some abstractions. I'm doing some more flags. Uh, I'm doing sort of a, another iteration of a flag, uh, which you'll see soon. Um, but, but still, you know, the abstracts, you know, uh, there's, there's still a lot that I wanted, want to do with them that I, I feel are very unfinished, the ones that I started uh, a few years ago uh, and that were displayed in the uh, Cola Show in Municipal Art Gallery. Molly, thank you so, so much for um, facilitating the questions and everyone thank you for being so uh, active and thoughtful in your questions. I personally adored seeing your figurative work, June, from the beginnings and how you said they look dated. I mean, maybe a little bit in the palette, but I feel like your, your, your um, intimate domestic scenes are exactly the kinds of um, images that we see today very much um, in terms of kind of uh, naming and celebrating um, black life and black culture and, um, I did not realize that they were so large. I'm so glad that that also got explained. I do have a final question for you, and that is to maybe push just a little bit on this very um, tense and uh, uh, aggravating time of where the ideas and the, uh, the battle for patriotism in this country is up for grabs and how you feel about these conversations that are happening and really almost um, battles for who is really um, defending America, who is um, going out to speak for, for our nation's best interest. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it just seems that every day, every day that American flag um, is becoming more and more of a representation of this racist fascism. That's, that's to me what it's representing more and more now, you know, with, um, with the um, militia groups that are showing up uh, and claiming sort of a, a defense and almost a salvation of this flag, you know, so it's just this, this uh, co-opting of it, you know, mm -hmm. so, so, uh, and it, it just as it just um escalates and compounds you know sort of this this new definition uh by the day it, it just mm -hmm. does because uh now as as you see the president um campaigning you know he's he uh, just doesn't care how he sounds. He he knows that we know he's talking to this base mm -hmm. and wanting to strengthen them and empower them and and uh, make them comfortable uh, with continuing uh, with their violent, you know, unscrupulous actions and 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 minimizing it. So so. So every day, sort of the the redefining of who we are, us sort of not giving up on that. You know, I just I just think if it was important enough for my ancestors who believed in this, you know, when they had absolutely nothing and 
and these beautiful words that that um, that were written by, you know, uh, our founding quote unquote founding fathers, you know, who were doing one thing with one hand and doing this whole other thing with the other hand. I I still believe it's it's something worth uh, fighting for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And how your work, even the context of two, three years ago when you were inspired by a dream and now today, how it resonates in an even more profound way. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, June. Thank the team behind the scenes at LMU and thank all the attendees. This has been an incredible conversation, an incredible um, gift to spend this afternoon with you. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I have one, one more little tiny mm -hmm. comment here that mm -hmm. I thought was wonderful to end. Uh, Joyce Lewis wrote, beautiful work, June. I think your mother would be so proud of you. Oh, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. Don't make me cry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you.